All right, let me close with one final round. First, a bit of background. Each one of us has 46 strands of DNA in each of our cells coiled into chromosomes. At the tips of each chromosome, at the end of each DNA strand, there's a cap, uh, like the tip of a shoelace, which keeps our DNA from unraveling and fraying. That cap is called a telomere. Every time our cells divide, though, a bit of that cap is lost. And when it's completely gone, the cell stops dividing or dies. So telomeres have been thought of as kind of our life fuse. They start shortening as soon as we're born, and when they're gone, we're gone. In fact, forensic scientists can take DNA from a blood stain and tell you how old the person was based on how long the telomeres are. The thought is, if we can slow down this ticking clock, slow down this shortening, we may be able to slow down aging and live longer. So what do we have to do? Stop smoking, number one, which has been shown to significantly eat away our protective telomeres. But is there anything in our diet that's accelerating the process, speeding up aging? We didn't know until last year. 120 food item questionnaire. Two foods were associated with telomere shortening, accelerated aging. You tell me which ones. In alphabetical order, coffee, fried foods, high-fat dairy, non-fried fish, processed meat, red meat, refined grains, or high-fructose corn syrup containing soda. I'll give you a hint. One of them was processed meats. But which was the other one? It was the fish nipping at our DNA. Eating fish appeared to age people's DNA six years, and processed meat 14 years, in terms of how short the telomeres were of fish and lunch meat eaters. So fish and bacon appears to speed aging up, but is there any way to slow aging down, or even actually turn back the cellular clock, and actually repair and lengthen our telomeres back up? Yes, but it appears we have to eat vegan. Dr. Dean Ornish wasn't satisfied with just reversing heart disease and cancer, so now he's trying his hand at reversing aging. There's a tree called uh, bristlecone pine, which is the oldest living thing on Earth. There's one in California that started growing around the time the Egyptian pyramids were being built, about 5,000 years ago, and the tree is still going strong scientists found an enzyme in its roots called telomerase, which could actually rebuild the telomeres, and humans have the enzyme too. The problem is that no one had ever found a way to boost its activity, but that's because no one had ever tried a whole foods plant-based diet before. In a study funded by the U.S. Department of Defense, Ornish found that after just three months of a whole foods plant-based diet, along with exercise, one could significantly boost telomerase activity. The accompanying editorial celebrated this breakthrough and hoped that this exciting outcome would encourage people to adopt a healthy lifestyle in order to avoid or combat cancer and age-related diseases. What about exercise for slowing cellular aging? Stress management help, but we can't always change our station in life, but we can always go out for a walk. Researchers studied 2,400 twins, and those that exercised more pumped up their telomeres along with their muscles. These were mostly folks in their 40s. Uh, does it still work in our 50s? Yes, those habitual exercisers were working out three hours a week better than the younger group. The heavy exercise group here was only averaging a half an hour a day. What happens if you study hardcore athletes? Here's the 
telomere lengths of young, healthy, regular folks at around age 20, and then age 50, which is what you'd expect. Our telomeres get eaten away as we age, but what about the athletes? They started out in the same boat, nice, long, young, healthy telomeres capping all their chromosomes, and then at age 50, they appear to still have the chromosomes of a 20-year-old. But these were marathon runners, triathletes, running 50 miles a week for 35 years. That's worse than the meditation retreat study. And it doesn't help us with the original question. What was it about the Ornish intervention that so powerfully protected telomeres after just three months? We saw that just stress management seemed to help, but what about the diet versus exercise? Was it the plant-based diet? Was it the walking 30 minutes a day? Or was it just because of the weight loss? In those three months, participants lost about 20 pounds. Maybe our telomeres are happy if we lose 20 pounds using any method, uh, starting a cocaine habit, getting tuberculosis, whatever. To answer this critical question, was it the plant-based diet specifically, the exercise, or the weight loss, ideally you do a study where you randomize people into at least three groups, a control group, that did nothing, sedentary with a typical diet, a group that just exercised, and a group that lost weight eating pretty much the same diet, but just in smaller portions. And I'm happy to report in 2013 just such a study was published. They took 400 women and randomized them into four groups, a portion-controlled diet group, an exercise group, and a portion-controlled diet and exercise group for a full year. And here they are. This is how long the telomeres were at baseline. After a year of doing nothing, there was essentially no change in the control group, which is what we'd expect. The exercise group was no wimpy, ornish 30-minute stroll, but 45 minutes, moderate to vigorous exercise like jogging. After a year of that, how did they do? They did no better. What about just the weight loss? Nothing and exercise and weight loss, no significant change either. So as long as we're eating the same lousy diet, it doesn't appear to matter how small our portions are, or how much weight we lose, or how hard we exercise. After a year, they saw no benefit. Whereas the Ornish group on the plant-based diet lost the same amount of weight after just three months, exercising less than half as hard, and saw significant telomere protection. So it wasn't the weight loss, it wasn't the exercise, it was the food. What about a plant-based diet is so protective? Higher consumption of vegetables, less butter and more fruit. And from the latest review, foods high in fiber and vitamins. But the key may be avoiding saturated fat. Swapping just 1% of saturated fat calories in a diet for anything else can add nearly a whole year of aging's worth of length onto our telomeres. Researchers have calculated how much our telomeres we may shave off per serving of foods like ham or hot dogs, bologna, salami, or other lunch meats. Fish consumption was also significantly associated with shortened telomeres. Saturated fats like palmitic acid, the primary saturated fat in salmon and found in meat, eggs, and dairy in general, can actually be toxic to cells. This has been demonstrated in heart cells, uh, bone marrow cells, pancreatic cells, brain cells. And the toxic effects on cell death rates happen right around what you see in the bloodstream of people who eat a lot of animal products. It may not be the saturated fat itself, though saturated fat may just be a marker for the increased oxidative stress and inflammation associated with animal-derived foods. With this link to saturated fat, no wonder lifelong low cholesterol levels has been related to longer telomeres and a smaller proportion of short telomeres. In other words, markers of slower biological aging with lower cholesterol. In fact, there's a rare congenital birth defect called progeria syndrome, where children essentially age 8 to 10 times faster than normal, and it seems associated with a, particularly in a, a particular inability to handle animal fats. Uh, in this case report, they started trying to lower her cholesterol starting at age 2, but uh, sadly she died sh shortly after this uh, picture was taken at age 10. 
The good news is that even if we've been beating up on our telomeres, despite past accumulated injury leading to shorter telomere length, current healthy behaviors may help to decrease our risk of some of the potential consequences like heart disease, eating more fruits and vegetables, and less meat, having more support from friends and families to attenuate the association between shorter telomeres and the ravages of aging. To summarize, here's a schematic of this constant battle. Inflammation, oxidation, damage, and dysfunction constantly hacking away at our telomeres. At the same time, our antioxidant defenses, a healthy diet, exercise, stress reduction, are constantly rebuilding them. Telomere length shortens with age. Progressive shortening of our telomeres leads to cell death or transformation to cancer, affecting the health and lifespan of an individual. But the rate at which telomere shortening can be either increased or decreased by specific lifestyle factors, a better choice of diet and activities has great potential to reduce the rate of telomere shortening or at least prevent excessive telomere shrinkage, leading to delayed onset of age-related diseases and increased lifespan. Let me end with one final topic. In 2010, we learned a lot more about aging and eating. Awarded the highest honor for scientific achievement in this country, one of the greatest biochemists of all time wrote that aging is a disease. The human lifespan simply reflects the level of free radical damage that accumulates in cells. When enough damage accumulates, cells can't survive properly anymore, and they just simply give up. First proposed in 1972, the mitochondrial theory of aging suggests that it's free radical damage to our cells' power source, known as mitochondria, that lead to a loss of cellular activity and function over time. It's a little like charging your iPod battery over and over again. Every time the capacity gets less and less. Mitochondria are like miniature blast furnaces inside our cells, where the food that we eat is converted into usable energy. In my Stopping Cancer Before It Starts DVD, I, I go into detail about the quantum biology of oxidative phosphorylation. But just to simplify, it is in these you know, fireworks inside the mitochondria, where the oxygen we breathe may get a hold of an electron we ate that was pumped with energy by plants, thanks to photosynthesis, and transform that oxygen molecule into what's called superoxide, which can damage our delicate cellular machinery, oxidize our cellular machinery. Basically, we're rusting. Right? That's what rust is, right? the oxidation of metal. And scientifically, aging has been considered the slow oxidation of our bodies. Like those brown age spots on the back of people's hands, that's just oxidized fat under the skin. Oxidant stress is why we get wrinkles, and why we lose some of our memory, why our organ systems break down as we get older. How do we slow down oxidation? By eating foods containing antioxidants. If you want to know if a food has a lot of antioxidants in it, you, you know, slice it open, expose it to air, expose it to oxygen, and see what happens. Does it oxidize? Does it turn brown? Think about our two most popular fruits, apples and bananas. Turn brown right away. Not a lot of antioxidants inside there. Right? How do you keep your fruit salad from turning brown, though? Add lemon juice, right? which has vitamin C in it, an antioxidant, which you know, can keep your food from oxidizing. It can do the same thing inside our bodies. Here's the catch, though. Many antioxidants can't penetrate through the mitochondrial membrane into the mitochondria. So they can protect the rest of the cell, protect our DNA, but they can't get inside the power plants of our cells, so may be helpless to slow down the aging process. That's why our bodies have an enzyme called superoxide dismutase. It's a detoxifying enzyme within our mitochondria that neutralizes superoxide and turns it back into oxygen. Because of its bomb-diffusing role, it's considered a tumor suppressor gene, staving off cancer. It's considered neuroprotective in our brain, staving off dementia. In fact, the reason women live longer than men may be because they have superior enzymatic activity of this superoxide dismutase. 
this mitochondrial theory of aging has enjoyed such universal acceptance within the scientific community that there was even a paper published last year asking whether there was anything more to aging at all. Okay, bottom line. How do we boost the enzyme activity of this anti-aging, anti-cancer, anti-Alzheimer's enzyme? Become a woman, or become a vegetarian. Last year, researchers compared this enzyme's activity in omnivores versus vegetarians. This is your superoxide dismutase enzyme activity if you're over 85. Now, if you're younger, the enzyme may work a little better, but when one eats vegetarian, it works a lot better. Eating vegetarian appears to boost this anti-aging enzyme's activity 300%, a threefold increase in the expression of the superoxide dismutase gene in the vegetarian group compared to the omnivore control group. We had no idea. No wonder vegetarians live longer. No wonder they have less cancer and cardiovascular disease. We had just never tested them for this enzyme before. A higher enzyme expression at the genetic level, thus a a better defense against superoxide radicals might be expected as a consequence of a vegetarian diet. So maybe that's why lower rates of cancer and chronic cardiovascular disease compared to omnivores. Yes, we eat more phytonutrients, but the higher protection against chronic disease in vegetarians may also be explained by what's called epigenetic changes. You think you're just born with genes and stuck with them? No. We now know that what we eat can turn on and off gene expression. And in this case, eating vegetarian seems to significantly boost the activity of one of the most important workhorse enzymes in the body. In my research into reversing aging video, I highlighted Dean Ornish's landmark study showing that a low-fat, whole foods, plant-based diet high in vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, along with walking, stress management, and support could not only reverse heart disease, open up arteries without drugs and surgery, and potentially reverse the progression of early-stage prostate cancer, but was the first intervention ever shown to increase telomerase activity, the enzyme that builds and maintains these caps at the tips of our chromosomes, called telomeres, which appear to slow the aging of our cells. Yes, this new finding was exciting and should encourage people to adopt a healthy lifestyle in order to avoid or combat cancer and age-related diseases, but was it the diet, the exercise, or the stress management? That's what researchers have been trying to tease out in the six years since this study was published. Let's look at stress first. In the film The Holiday, Cameron Diaz exclaimed, severe stress caused the DNA in our cells to shrink until they can no longer replicate. Did Hollywood get the science right? Do people who are stressed have shorter telomeres? To answer that question, researchers measured the telomere lengths in mothers of chronically ill children. What could be more stressful than that? The longer a woman had spent being the main carer of her ill child, the shorter were her telomeres. The extra telomere shortening in these stressed mothers was equivalent to that caused by at least a decade of aging. We see the same thing in caregivers of Alzheimer's patients, and in those suffering severe work-related exhaustion. Even those abused as children may grow up with shorter telomeres. Not much we can do about our past, but if we manage our stress, can we grow some of our telomeres back? Well, if you go off to a meditation retreat and meditate for 500 hours, you can indeed boost your telomerase activity. 600 hours of meditation may be beneficial as well. But come on. There's got to be a quicker fix, and this exciting new study delivered. Caregivers of family members with dementia randomized to just 12 minutes of daily meditation for eight weeks, so just about 10 hours in total, experienced significant benefit. Better mental and psychological function accompanied by an increase in telomerase activity, suggesting improvement in stress-induced cellular aging. I'll cover diet and exercise next.
One of the most recognized consequences of aging is a decline in immune function, illustrated by vulnerability to dying from the flu, a poor response to vaccinations. But about 20 years ago, a paper was published showing that the immune cells of 80-year-olds produce significantly more pro-inflammatory signals, suggesting the worst of both worlds, a decline in the part of the immune system that fights specific infections, but an aggravation of nonspecific overreactions that can lead to inflammation. This has since been formalized in a concept referred to as inflammaging. Uh, chronic low-grade inflammation we now know is typical of aging which may be responsible for the decline in the onset of disease in the elderly. So what can we do about it? Inflammaging appears to be a major consequence of growing old. Can it be prevented or cured? The key to successful aging and longevity may be to decrease chronic inflammation without compromising an acute response when exposed to pathogens. How are we going to do that? Nutrition. What we eat is probably the most powerful and pliable tool that we have to attain a chronic and systemic modulation of the aging process. In the first systematic review of the associations between dietary patterns and biomarkers of inflammation ever published, the dietary patterns associated with inflammation were almost all meat-based, or so-called Western diet patterns, while vegetable and fruit-based, or healthy patterns, tended to be inversely associated, meaning more plant-based, less inflammation. The reason why meat is associated with inflammation may be because of both the animal protein and the animal fat. In the first interventional study that separately evaluated the effects of vegetable and animal protein on inflammatory status as it relates to obesity and metabolic syndrome when you're trying to lose weight, what they found was that a higher intake of animal origin protein, specifically meat, is associated with higher plasma levels of inflammatory markers in obese adults. Uh, the reason obesity is associated with increased risk of many cancers may be because of obesity-associated inflammation. Obesity-driven inflammation may stimulate prostaglandin-mediated estrogen biosynthesis in breast tissues. That means the inflammation may activate the enzyme that allows breast tumors to make their own estrogen via this inflammatory compound called prostaglandin. If you measure the level of prostaglandins in women's urine, it correlates with breast cancer risk. And how do you get high levels of this inflammatory compound? Smoking, a high saturated fat diet, and obesity. Why does eating saturated fat lead to prostaglandin production? Because prostaglandins are made from arachidonic acid, and arachidonic acid is a major ingredient in animal fats. And so animal fats contain arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is what our body produces inflammatory compounds like prostaglandins with, and they can then go on to stimulate breast cancer growth, and may also play a role in colon cancer, lung cancer, or head and neck cancer as well. Whereas whole plant foods have anti-inflammatory effects, though some plants are better than others. Uh, the folks may eat five a day of high antioxidant fruits and vegetables, like berries and greens, had a significantly better impact on reducing systemic inflammation and liver dysfunction compared to five a day of the more common low antioxidant fruits and veggies, like bananas and lettuce. To recap, the traditional model of how fruits and vegetables protect against cancer is that their antioxidants prevent the buildup of free radicals, also known as reactive oxygen species, ROS, which would otherwise go on to damage our cellular DNA, membranes, etc., which could lead to the transformation of healthy cells into damaged, diseased, or dying cells. But in that landmark 2003 kiwifruit study, we learned that there's a second pathway as well. Phytonutrients actually modulate gene expression and can increase our cellular defenses, such that even if there is some damage to our DNA, our cells may recover 
instead of being irreparably lost. The Kiwi study looked at one of those defenses, one DNA repair enzyme, but there are many, many ways our cells repair our DNA. We don't mess around when it comes to protecting our genes. So question number one, what effect does kiwi fruit consumption have on all these other defenses? And question number two, what if we branch out and test multiple fruits and veggies at the same time? You'll remember that there did not seem to be a dose response with the kiwis. right? As far as this DNA repair enzyme was concerned, you were either eating kiwis or not. It didn't really matter how many. But man cannot live on kiwis alone. What if you did a mix of fruits and veggies? Could we break through that ceiling? Now, studies are expensive, particularly if the kiwi people refuse funding because you have the audacity to test other fruit. Uh, so they wanted to make this study count. So when they designed their plant portfolio, they went all out. Check it out. Green tea, rosehip juice, berries, 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 pomegranate, dark blue grapes, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, red cabbage, kale, blue potatoes, dark chocolate, walnuts, rosemary, oregano. This study is making me hungry. I don't know if you noticed, but this is that same amazing research group that blessed the world with that study of thousands of different foods, so they knew what they were doing. OK, long story short, plant-based diets can prevent development of several you know, chronic age-related diseases, blah, blah, blah. We know that. Yes, but how, and what about that plateau effect? This is what they did. Three groups. The antioxidants to the teeth group compared to the three kiwi a day group compared to control took blood from everyone, and then, for the first time ever reported, did this microarray analysis where you can measure the effects of a plant-based diet on expression of hundreds of different genes at a time. The first to investigate the influences of healthy diets on gene expression in whole blood, this was the study. All right, well, the Kiwi group was able to significantly regulate not just one gene, as I showed in the 2003 study, but a total of five. Meanwhile, the very berry group significantly regulated five times more—25 genes. Conclusion. The observed changes in blood cell gene expression profile suggest that the beneficial effects of a plant-based diet on human health may be mediated through optimization of defense processes.